Hello everyone, my name is Aaron Corcoran and I'm going to give you a tutorial over through tracker software for 2D and 3D tracking of bats and other animals at wind turbines. Uh, software could also be used at other locations that don't involve turbines, but we are customizing it for that tur turbine application right now. So this is through tracker. Once you have it opened up, you can install it on uh, your machine and it should open up and show you this display. This is showing two open windows for displaying images from video files, some controls down here, which we'll go over, and some progress notes that shows the current status. So in this video, we're going to cover the 2D tracking features and review features of the software. There's also options, and we'll have separate videos for covering how to make 3D tracks. There's options up here for loading a project after you've already created one, saving it, uh, exporting data to spreadsheets such as a CSV file if you want to export and view that data elsewhere. And then there's other tools for exporting clips of tracks, making a 3D calibration, visualizing tracks, calibrating thermal cameras, and automated classification. So there's a lot of tools here. We're going to go through one by one and show these, um, but again today we're going to start with 2D detection, which would be your first step in the process. And if you're only doing 2D detection, if you're not doing 3D, then this is the main tool you're going to be using for the software. So if we want to automate it, process a new video, you just go up here to File, New 2D Detection. And it's going to give a little warning here that you need to make sure that wherever you're saving the data to, that you have administrator privileges. And if you're gonna run a large file, such as an eight, nine hour file, do a little test batch first and make sure you're not getting an error uh, so that you're saving it in a location where you have administrator privileges. So I'm just gonna do yes right there. And then we have our window here for sh setting up the uh, 2D detection options. So the first thing we're gonna do is choose our video file. And I've included some example videos here. And so I'm going to go to our example video. This is a clip recorded with some Axis thermal cameras. So I'll select that one. And it's automatically loaded that video and found that there were 180 frames. So you can set which of those frames you wanna process. I'm just gonna leave it to those options of one through 180. Then you have the option to set a range of pixel sizes of acceptable objects. So the default is a minimum of five pixels to be accepted as attractable objects and a maximum of 500 pixels. So I'm just gonna leave it at that. If you have a higher resolution camera, you might wanna have higher pixel size, but uh, these cameras are on the order of uh, 640 by 480 pixel resolution. So that typically works fairly well in my experience. Then there's a noise sensitivity. So if you want to get the most number of tracks, but you're able to accept a little bit more noise, then I'd set the sensitivity at high, which is what I recommend for these thermal cameras. You can change that to lower settings and see how that works for you. Now the software is automatically going to attempt to detect and remove the turbine. I'm using an edge detector here as my default, which I recommend starting with. We have also experimented with applying a segmentation neural network, and you can try that out or build your own if you're having trouble with this and, and build that in. Right now, these are the ones that are built in. So I'm just gonna use the default of the edge detector. Then you can set the number of pixels around the turbine to have as a buffer. So this will, after detecting the turbine, it will remove any pixels that are within, in this case, 10 pixels of the detected turbine. So if the turbine is moving more, or if you're looking up at the turbine in an orientation where the blades are moving relatively faster, you might want to up that, and this will help deal with the smear of the turbine. So I'm going to leave it at the default for this. Uh, then for the header rows, sometimes when you're recording thermal vid video, it will record the timestamp in certain header rows. So I have some options here for FLIR and AXIS cameras. They put them in different locations. So in AXIS, it's the first 25 rows. 
All right, then you can run this either with a single processor or you can run it with multiple processors. So you can check to see how many processors you have on your machine here. On my computer, I have eight uh, parallel processing cores that are available to me. If you process in parallel, you're not gonna be able to see the images in real time. So for illustrative purposes here, I'm just gonna do one. But if I was gonna process a video that was a large video and I'm gonna set this up overnight, I would set it up to the, the max number or maybe one less than that. So I'm gonna leave it at one for here. You can change the file name that the data is gonna be saved within. And here it just takes the same name as the video and it's gonna put it in default in the same folder where that video was stored and just saved it with this .mat extension. So you have to keep that extension, but you can change the name or change the folder where that data is gonna be saved. For these purposes, I'm gonna leave it at the default. So. Okay, then there's some 2D tracking options. After detecting the objects in the frame, it's gonna to attempt to link them between frames to generate tracks. And I'm gonna leave a minimum track length of five detections. So if you get fewer than that, it's pretty easy to get a false detection of a turbine tip or a cloud or just random noise for that matter. So I recommend having a minimum of four or five uh, detections for an acceptable track. Then there's the maximum gap length. After uh, not making a detection on a given track, it will keep looking in that area for up to this number of frames. So in this case, it's gonna look for an object in the same area uh, where it's expected to be for five frames. I'm gonna leave it at that. Again, if you up this higher, um, then it's pretty likely that you're gonna get increased problems with cloud detections and other issues of false positives. Then there's a match threshold and this threshold is looking at how many pixels away from where the track is expected will accept to incorporate a new detection as part of that track. So it's using a Kalman filter to predict where the next detection is gonna be. If it's within 20 pixels of this case of that location, it will accept it as part of the track. If it's beyond that distance, then it will not accept it. So again, if you are, if you have jumpy data where your footage is not recorded at a consistent frame rate, you might wanna have higher than this. If you have more consistent, you can use lower. I'm gonna use these default. So once you have the settings all set up, then you just hit run through tracker. And it's gonna show the raw image here on the left, and it's picking up a bat here, and a background subtracted and turbine subtracted image over here on the right. So it's processing those 180 frames, and it's just showing snippets every 10th frame of the update. And it's finished processing those 180 frames. It shows down here that it detected 88 objects and it saved the data in that file that we had set up. So now it's automatically tracked it and made those detections into a number of tracks. So in this case, two individual tracks were made. And you can see down here, well, I'll show you the controls options now. So the frame of the video is shown here, and then the track number is shown here. So we can select our different tracks. And you can see there was that one bat that's flying in over here, and then it, it put that into one track, and then the bat went behind the turbine, and then it came out the other side, and this part was classified into a second track over here. Now we could set a gap length that's longer and it would be able to join that into a single track, but then again, that would cause further problems with false positives elsewhere. So this seems to be a, a pretty good compromise. Now if we go back to an individual track, we can see the individual frames. So we can advance a frame and then it will show the background subtracted image over here. And you can see, I can just advance the frame. You can either use this a button over here on the screen, or you can use the right arrow to advance or the left arrow to go back. So you can just click through here and you can see it's detecting that bat pretty well in each frame, it's picking it up. And you can also see the outline of the turbine. So the turbine is showing up at a slightly lighter color where it's background subtracted the turbine itself. 
uh, using that algorithm that we talked about. And it's picking up that bat pretty well here. And it's joined those individual points into a track, which is track number one here. Now you can skip between different tracks either by selecting it in the track dropdown here or by just using the up or the down arrows on the keyboard. So you can quickly go through uh, different tracks and go between them. Now you can also classify the tracks. So if I want to classify this one, here it's currently unclassified. I'm going to say that this is a bat and do the drop down here and do the same for the next track and classify that as a bat. I can also just use the numbers. So you can see here that zero is unclassified. I have a number of different classifications here. And you can just use the number on your keyboard once you get familiar with these. And so example, if I just wanna change that, I'm gonna click on the screen to make sure it's activated. Now, if I press two, I can change it to a bird or press number one, I can quickly change it to a bat. So this allows you to rapidly go through and process uh, classifications manually. Now I'm gonna show you what a classification and detection file looks like that I ran overnight for about a nine hour file that we recorded at the NREL. And we can just load a new project here. And I'm gonna go to where I saved that on my computer. Oh, actually, it's over here. Okay, and this was about a nine hour recording doing parallel processing on a fairly fast computer. It took about eight or nine hours to process all of that. And you can see that in this particular file, it had 612 detections. Now this was actually done in winter and there was not a ton of animals around. You can see what it would look like if you're processing an entire night of data. So here we can look at track number one, and this one is actually an airplane. So I can do number five, uh, no, six, airplane, and then go to the next track. And this one, you can see it picks it up, and it's pretty close to the background noise, but it is able to track it. That looks like some kind of animal to me, so I'll just call it a five. Can go to my next one. Again, that one looks like another kind of animal. It's probably the same track here. So you can rapidly go through and classify a large number of detections and tracks um, pretty rapidly. So again, this was an airplane and so forth. Now, we're moving more towards automated classification. And so far, I just have an example of how that might work. We're going to build on this further. So if you want to classify the 2D tracks, I have an automated classifier in here that applies some thresholds based on the sinuosity of the tracks and the speed of the tracks to automatically try to find false detections. Um, that is, uh, detections that are actually of clouds or of turbine tips. And by running that auto classifier, going up to tools, uh, classify tracks, then 461 of those tracks were auto-classified, and I'm classifying it here as nine other. So those were automatically classified for us, and I didn't have to do that. Now, if I want to look at those and choose which tracks are going to be visualized. So now I only want to see those other tracks, and I want to process those on their own. So I'm going to unselect all the rest and only select other and click Finish. And now in our track depth drop down menu, it's only all of these are the tracks that were classified as other. So here is one, there's a turbine tip. I'm fine with that. For my purposes, um, other is going to be fine. If I wanted to change it to turbine tip, I could classify it as turbine tip. We can go through here, and that looks like an airplane. So we could probably have an a classifier that only picks up airplanes, but right now that's getting put into other because it's not an animal. So I'm fine with that. Uh, there, this looks to be a edge of a cloud. And because it's jumping around that track, 
it's picking that up. So again, this is not an animal, so I'm fine with that being other. You can quickly just kind of step through these and make sure that there's no animals. These all appear to be clouds. And so this can save you quite a bit of time. We can also build additional classifiers, for example, uh, to help identify obvious tracks that are insects, for example, that are moving too fast for it to be a bat. So that shows some of the features for 2D detection and review. When I'm done, I can go up here and save the project, and that just automatically saved the data into that same .mat file where it was saved. If I go to close the file, the program, then it will ask if we want to save the data, request a crow's through tracker, would you like to save the classification data? I'm going to say yes, and it will close out. So that is your overview for 2D detection and manual and beginnings of automated classification in through tracker.